Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge welcome to Kieran Lappin! I feel a wee bit like a warm-up act here, so you can relax. I feel a bit like Britney Spears as well, but there'll be no moves like that. So, I like to stand here when I'm talking. So, yes, cutting it in the modern, in the modern world. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Patrick Michaeliski and Patrick, uh, who it was Mac, invited me to speak, and he, he texted me a few months ago, and he said, would you mind doing a TEDx-style talk for the pupils of St. Louis College? And I, without hesitation, I said, Absolutely, I'll do that. And I got off my phone and, I, and immediately went to the computer to Google a TEDx style talk. And, and also some loans that never heard of, never heard of. And I'm a traditionalist and Paul's in some mind. So, um, I live and work in Derry. And Derry is well known uh, for his Peace Bridge, uh, his Guild Hall, but best of all, it's known for his Derry girls, obviously. And my two girls go to this school, or did go to this school. I work in Alta Gelvin Hospital. It's um, a district general hospital that serves about 450,000 population and we do all of our trauma and orthopaedics here right from Fermanagh to Rome, Derry, right up to the north coast. And this is our new facelift, we move into this next year, so there's been a good bit of investment and these three wards, there's a pointer here, the three wards are going to be our new unit. So this is me busy hammering with a hammer, a nice heavy hammer into somebody's pelvis, taking a bit of bone. This was taken a good few years back when I worked in the Ulster with a few colleagues, and I was taking a bit of bone to stick it into this part of this man's wrist. And a decade later, he almost had a fatal collision. This was Ryan Farquhar, and Farquhar nearly came off his bike, and he retired after that. And there are not many retired motorcyclists usually to die. You know. So that's the sort of work I will do from day to day. The other part of my work is orthopedics, where I will look at wrist replacement, elbow replacement, and different types of replacement. So it's a very fulfilling job. Now, I'll point you to this story. This is Robert Liston. Robert Liston was a surgeon in the 1800s, and he was known to be one of the quickest surgeons around. And he had to be quick because there was no anesthesia, no pain relief. So he could take a leg off in two and a half minutes. And he used to start every operation by saying, Time, gentlemen. Okay? So this gentleman is famous, but famous for the bad reason that on this particular day, he was taking this leg off. His assistant was trying to hold the burly guy down. The guy was wriggling all over the place. He cut the leg off, he cut the fingers of his assistant off, and he accidentally cut the coat of the gentleman standing opposite. And when he saw the blood, the man thought he'd been stabbed. He collapsed, he died of a heart attack. Three days later, the gentleman on the table, the patient, he died of sepsis and gangrene. And the day later, the assistant died as well. So the pearls and pitfalls that we talk about in surgery, little tips, things to do, and pitfalls, things to avoid. But today I want to talk about Pits, uh, pearls and pitfalls really about your life and your career. And I think this pertains to any, any career that you do. And I have a number of key points. The first key point is perseverance and resilience. And you all be mindfulness. My children tell me about mindfulness, so you know what I'm talking about in these two terms. And perseverance is not persistent in doing something that's difficult. You may come get, like, up against failures, but you bounce back again. The second thing that I want to talk about is really savouring your life and your experiences. And, and Appreciate and now whatever you do, be it your hobby, your sport, uh, or your career. And the third thing I want to touch on is really balance, work-life balance, and, and getting the correct balance. So, a long time ago in Bethlehem, <laughs> it was 40 years, believe it or not, to the day that myself and Patrick Michaeliski started at St. Paul's, fresh-faced and enthusiastic. Uh, and I was very lucky, and Stevie Mallon and see sitting in the corner there, I was very lucky to know what I wanted to do. I don't know what, I probably watched too much Quincy MD or whatever was on the TV at the time, and I knew I wanted to do medicine. And that was it. And I feel sorry for people who don't know what they want to do, because um, there's so much option out there now. But anyway, I made it into a worse looking uniform and a, a, a badder looking haircut, and I went into some, some migrants. And I played a lot of golf and a lot of football. I got my handicap down to a healthy five, played a wee bit for Clanner rode a bike a bit and had a little rock band. So I obviously took my studies very seriously at that time. And I didn't actually seem to work at all until I hit my elements and I realised, God, you have to work for your elements. So I did well in my O levels, didn't get the requisite grades in the A level. And I had to make that decision then what I wanted to do. And I always wanted to do medicine. And Nora McCluskey uh, was long since dead, retired or dead. And Nora was um, our careers advisor, and Nora took me around her house and she said, I want to give you a good kick up the arse, she said. 
you always wanted to do medicine, keep on doing it. And I think it was that, and something sparked in my head, I said, okay, I'll go back. So I went back to Belfast Tech, and I repeated that year, and every cloud has a silver lining. I met my wife at that stage a long, long time ago. Um, so I got my exams, I got into medicine then, and I got down to Queens. And you think I would know, my, you know, have good lessons in life, I would buckle down, work hard. No, no. The crack was too good in Queens. I think I can remember the two nights I wasn't out in the first year. Uh, so we had our first medical exams were after 18 months, and you, you didn't do what you guessed, it's very easy, you know, you just had modules and you pass them and you go on. But we, we had a long period of no exams, you know. You didn't think you were stupid until the very end. <laughs> so anyway, I failed that exam and I had to then show a bit of persistence and perseverance and resilience and bounce back and, and go, and, go and repeat the exam. And I was probably that close to getting kicked out of medicine. So not a, not a thing to do, not a thing I recommend to my children. But I worked hard, got the exam, buckled down, and then I got on and got my degree and, and I, I came out of Queen's with my MB. So my first job was in Ards Hospital. And in Ards, it was a busy, busy, busy college hostel. I worked on one and three rota, sometimes on one and two. And that equated to about 110, 120 hours a week. It was a busy job. And I decided then, I don't know why, because there's going to be a lot of exams ahead of me, and the exams didn't really work. So I decided I wanted to be a surgeon. So I buckled down and said, I'll be a surgeon. And I moved to the Royal, this is a facelifted Royal. And I took a job um, as an anatomy demonstrator where we cut dead bodies up all day long and showed the medical students what to do. So that was part of my job. The other part was to work in the Royal ED, the emergency department. So a busy job, and the time of the troubles, a lot of shooting still happened. So I had to study for my first part, which is a very difficult exam. So I failed it once, I failed it twice. And I remember one of the anatomy tutors said to me, you're probably just going to give up now, are you? you know, forget about a career in surgery. But I, I persisted and I, I pushed on and I got it. And then I, I moved around really all the hospitals in Northern Ireland and then I got my second part. Then I had the next challenge of trying to get into orthopaedics. And orthopaedics is a difficult specialty to get in. There were only like four or five jobs a year potentially to get into it. But I persisted and I got, uh, I did my research, I got another degree, I did a Master of Philosophy. And that's what got me into orthopaedics. I spent six years in orthopaedics. And I think at the tender age of 34, I did my last exam. So a lot of exams, but you enjoyed the journey along the way and you did it. So 34, I did my last exam. I got a job then. Well, not then, I went over to England. I joined this year in England. So I went to do a fellowship year in England. And what we do at the end of our orthopedic training is we will, we will take a fellowship year out to specialize in something. So I specialized in upper limb trauma and orthopedics. And I worked in a place, I have four minutes left, I worked in a place outside, outside Charlie. And a great time, got to a lot of Man United games, didn't go to see Liverpool ever, but I had a few Man United games and had a good time. Came back and then I got a job up in Derry and I've been up there 13 years and I've really enjoyed it. So the first notion to say is, never stop trying, you know. If it's in your hobby, it's a, if it's in your sport, if it's in your job, never stop trying. You're never far from the goal. So my second point is, is about savouring and it's appreciating the moment. It's appreciating the time in your job. And Eckhart Tolle, Tolle is a, a German-born philosopher and a spiritual author, and he's got some fantastic quotes. It's not uncommon for people to spend their whole life waiting to start living. The more you focus on time, past and future, the more you miss the now, the precious thing that there is. And, and I'll give you an example of this. This is one of my colleagues right here. He's a very diligent guy, and he used to be in at seven in the morning, home at seven at night. I was in at nine in the morning, out of five or four, maybe three, if the clinic finished early. So I, I, I was efficient, but he was very diligent. And he would be a very stressed sort of guy, and he didn't appreciate the time. And he said to me once, like, how do you cope in theatre with phone calls and you know, people annoying you and I want to ask like, this patient? And I said, listen, I don't take any phone calls. I enjoy my operating. And I, I always said to people, operating or doing that part of your job, you should be like going to the driving range and the bucket of balls. You should really just go and enjoy it and do what you're good at. So that was the advice I gave to him. Also I told him to drink at least a half a bottle of wine a night and, and start playing the electric guitar. And we'll come back to that, okay? So this is just another point. At the age of 38, I had never skied. And I went skiing once. And what I would say to you, if you haven't skied, you have to go skiing. Don't waste 38 years of your life the way I did. So I endeavored then at that stage when I could, when my legs worked, to go at least skiing two to three times a year. Cost me a fortune. 
I didn't do any summer holidays, that makes me feel any better. But anyway, don't wait till it's all too late and you're retired. So my last point is really about balance. Uh, Jim Rohn is a, was a motivational speaker for the States, and he wrote a lot of books about strategy and, and wealth and health. And he said, time is, is more valuable than money. You can get more money, but you cannot get more time. And that, that couldn't be true. And the older you get, you start to appreciate that more. You guys don't appreciate it just yet. But this is a little concept, and now that I know TEDx and I've looked it all up, uh, I ran into so many talks about Ikigai. And Ikigai, my daughter bought this book, and I just seen it lying around. And I, I, sometimes, I was once accused of being too happy in my work. Somebody said, one of my colleagues said that. And I thought, why am, why am I happy? I do what I love, I do what the world needs, I do what I can get paid for, and what I think I'm good at. And this is a concept, it's worth, worth having a little read about Ikigai. And this is what I try to, try to follow. So I keep my balance in life with my, my season ticket. Uh, I visit Fred the Red as often as, as often as I can. Every Wednesday afternoon I try and get up to this beautiful place to play, to play golf. I sometimes drag a few McConvilles up the road. There's a few McConvilles in the audience and my brother John. And if you really want to test your heart and see if it will explode going up one more gap, you should do the initial 100 sometime and cycle around the hills of Derry. And the last thing, do you remember that guy? He was so studious. He's now drinking more than a half bottle of wine. He's let his hair go along and he plays in a little band called Bad Medicine with me. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Kieran. I'll tell you about one question before we go. So, obviously, you've shown uh, great examples and you've got a great story about perseverance. When you did fail those exams, how did you keep running towards the next one with the same energy and enthusiasm? Um, I suppose I've met a good woman as well who was egging me on as well. But no, I, I wanted to do it. If you've got a dream you want to do it, you've got to keep pushing on. And it's not about, believe it or not, about how smart you are. It was more to do with just sticking up the books and, and pushing on. You know? Well, it's been a great story. Let's hear it for Karen, everybody. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. What a fantastic way to open the event. And comments to take away from uh, Kieran's talk there, uh, 